Hi, in this video, we will talk about Newton's law problem solving strategy, or as you will hear me call it, the standard strategy. The standard strategy is an application of the general problem solving approach that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. In this context, we are applying that general approach to situations that specifically involve forces or Newton's law problems. So let me summarize the strategy that you see on screen here. So when we are tackling a force problem, we start by drawing a free body diagram or a force diagram. This is a diagram that indicates all the forces acting on the object. This is the step that generally takes the most consideration, care, and time to do it correctly. Once we have a correct free body diagram drawn, then we'll spend some time indicating certain pieces of information that will be useful in problem solving. First, we take some time considering the direction of the acceleration of the body that you are drawing free body diagram for. And that is so that we can choose a coordinate axis in which one of the axes is parallel to the acceleration. There are some special circumstances that you may consider either where acceleration is zero or there are particularly difficult questions where it might actually be better to have access pointed another way. But in general, the rest of the problem solving steps turn out to be easiest when we choose our axis so that the x-axis is parallel to the acceleration. Once we have chosen our coordinate axis, then we do what the, the coordinate axes are for. It's so that we can describe the forces in terms of their components in the x and y directions. And to talk about x and y directions, you need to know what directions x and y are. Now, following through steps one through three, you will be at a place where your free body diagram has a lot of information indicated graphically on the diagram. So we end the standard strategy with the final step, which is writing down the equations that we are going to solve for. Those equations come from Newton's second law. Now, I want you to notice how this doesn't really leave us with any particular solutions. We've written down an equation and that's it. And part of that is because, well, the rest is math. <laughs> and perhaps less glibly. Uh, the rest of the steps depend on exactly what it is the problem is asking for. Uh, we call the standard strategy standard strategy because it's the set of steps that you would go through in order to solve any problem involving forces regardless of what the question actually asks for. So this is the strategy to get to the system of equations. And then um, actually solving those system of equations, it depends on what the question is asking for. So uh, from that point on, the exact steps will vary depending on what your question asks for. Now, your textbook will give its own version of Newton's law strategy. And I will do a separate video that draws the comparison more thoroughly. In the meantime, let me just point you to where in your textbook those uh, Newton's Law strategies in the textbook can be found. A portion of them is in section 5.7. They introduce these steps um, as they introduce the free body diagrams. Here's the problem solving strategy for constructing free body diagrams. These are the textbook steps for drawing free body diagrams. And because the textbook chose to split this up, the rest of the steps, you will have to find them in section 6.1, solving problems with the Newton's laws. So here under problem solving strategies, they uh, describe the problem solving strategy for applying Newton's laws of motion. Again, I'll do a separate video that draws this comparison more thoroughly, but this is where you can find the textbook versions of these strategies. And since in this class, we are using the portable TA rather extensively, let me point out the parts of the portable TA that relate to situations that deal with forces. I believe it's introduced in question 8-6. So let me get to chapter 8. Here's chapter 8, 8-6.
In this problem, Andrew LB introduces something that he calls multi-block strategy. And again, in a separate video, I'll draw more thorough comparison of our standard strategy and the Newton's law strategy that is introduced in the portable TA. Now, back to our presentation of the standard strategy. There is a value in seeing these four steps laid out and having them numbered one, two, three, four. And you will see me cite those four steps quite a few times throughout the semester. But I think uh, simply seeing the four steps spelled out isn't quite as useful as uh, seeing the examples of uh, seeing them applied. So let me give you three examples of the standard strategy application in this video. And you will see plenty more examples as we work through homework questions in other future lectures and virtual class sessions. So um, let me give you the description of the first example. Example one, block on an inclined plane. It's kind of what it sounds like. Let's say we have an inclined plane and we have a block sitting on it. And if we want to make the situation particularly simple, we can say this surface is frictionless. And because this is going to come up, let's say we know the angle of the incline. Okay, uh, that seems like a complete description of situation as far as it goes. And for the moment, we don't know exactly what question the question is asking. But given this situation, we have enough information to start following the standard strategy. So let me work my way through the standard strategy. The first step is to draw a free body diagram. So let me draw a free body diagram of the block. I try to draw the simplest free body diagram possible. So I'm going to represent the block of mass m by a simple dot. I don't need any more detail than that. And I start thinking through what forces must be on this block. There's probably going to be a gravity on it because I think the block is on Earth. So gravity must be pulling it down. Now, as I look at the situation, I know the block is not accelerating downward straight. So that can be the only force on the block. The block is on a surface. So I think there's going to be some contact force from the surface. One of the contact forces would be the normal force, the force that's perpendicular to the surface. So let me draw that force, normal force. And I might draw a little bit of an auxiliary figure so that I can indicate the direction of that normal force. And this dotted line would be parallel to the incline of the surface. So theta should be the same theta here. Then I ask myself again, did I draw all the forces? Usually the thing that's good to check is what's the direction of acceleration of the block? The block should be sliding, accelerating along the surface. And I look at the forces that I've drawn and try to see, can I, with these forces I've drawn, can I make the net force go in the direction of acceleration? So I look at that and see if my answer is yes. <laughs> if my answer is yes, good. And I also look at what things are touching the block for the purpose of uh, accounting for all the contact forces. So here, the only thing touching the block is the surface. So I want to account for the contact forces from the surface. Each surface is going to potentially have two contact forces, normal force and friction. Here, I already accounted for normal force and friction the problem. I set it up to be frictionless, so I don't have to worry about friction. But if uh, this were a question that had a friction force, then I would have to account for friction. But let me handle friction in another video. Okay, so I'm done with the step number one. As I was saying, this is a step that takes most consideration, care, and time. Okay, let's do step number two. Uh, identify the direction of acceleration. We've already done that. So the only thing remaining to do is to define our coordinate system. I think so. I want to make my x direction along the incline. That's going to be my x. 
so my y will have to be perpendicular to the incline. This way, my x direction is parallel to acceleration, and my y direction has no component of acceleration along that direction. Okay, uh, let me draw a version of this axis that's uh, nice and big, centered around the object. All right, step number three is to break down forces into their components. Now, the normal force N does not need to be decomposed. It's already along the y direction only. The gravity, on the other hand, it's got component along the y and component along the x direction. So I'll need to break it down into those components. And it's when I do this step, I also like to write down what the expressions for these components are in terms of some given quantities. Like here, I'm given theta, so I can express these legs of the right triangle in terms of the hypotenuse, mg, and the angle theta. Now, this is where I would uh, advise caution. People who get into habit of saying, oh, x is cosine and y is a sine, tend to run into problems. <laughs> Because it won't always be the case that you can automatically associate x with the cosine and y with the sine. Instead, this is what I do advise. So the first is draw the triangle. I've already drawn one um, as I was labeling these components. Once you've drawn the triangle, then now you have to go through the geometry exercise. To locate any known angle um, onto that triangle, so in this case, all right, I have theta here. I know this is 90 degrees. So I happen to know this is 90 degrees minus theta. Um, ah, and uh, I know this is 90 degrees, because horizontal and vertical. So this angle here must be 90 degrees minus 90 degrees minus theta. So 90 degrees cancel out and I end up with a theta. So this angle must be theta. Uh, let me clean up this diagram a little bit and label that angle as theta. Okay, so this angle is theta. Doing this correctly every time will take some practice, so I recommend that you get practice whenever you get a chance. So with this angle labeled, now we can correctly figure out the magnitudes of the components using so ka toa, or in this case, so and ka. Sine is the opposite of our hypotenuse. So this opposite side of the angle theta will have the magnitude of mg sine theta. And this adjacent side is uh, ka. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it'll have magnitude of mg cosine theta. Notice how it's the x component that becomes associated with the sine theta in this case. And there isn't one simple rule I can give you that'll always work. So the rule I am giving you is draw the triangle, figure out the angles always. Okay, that's step number three. So let me now do the final step of writing down Newton's second law equations. So Newton's second law says net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And these arrows are there to remind you that these are vector equations. This single equation actually stands for two. One that says the x component of net force is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction, and net force in the y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. And if we were somehow working on a problem that had a full three dimensions, then there would be g component as well. So uh, that's what we have to write down. Let's do that. So first, net force in the x directions. I look at the free body diagram that I've drawn and I look for the forces along the x component. My normal force has no component along x direction. My gravity has one component along the x direction. So mg sine theta is going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. 
Now the way we define our coordinate axis, the entirety of the acceleration will be in the x direction. So I can do away with the subscript and just say mass times acceleration. Okay, let's write down the second equation, net force in the y direction. So here I have the force, um, normal force, the entire thing is along the y direction. Gravity has a component in the y direction, mg cosine theta. And it's in the negative y direction. And uh, there's a couple ways you can go about it. I will give you the way I prefer. So I prefer to write down all my quantities so that all the variables like m and g are positive. And anytime I need to indicate direction, I prefer to indicate it in my equations. So here I would write down minus mg cosine theta to indicate my expectation that the y component of gravity is pointing in the minus y direction. I found this useful for those times when we get a direction of a force like a friction force that's not in the expected direction. Um, in those cases, having one of the variables come out to be minus uh, highlights for me that something has gone as uh, unexpected. So with that, um, this is going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. Now here, the way we chose our coordinate axis will make the y component of acceleration zero. So this is equal to zero. And this is really why we choose our coordinate system the way we chose it, so that the second of our equations is a bit simpler than the other one. Because uh, whenever an equation has everything equal to zero, um, there are things that cancel out, it makes life easier most of the time. So this is the end of the standard strategy. Now, I will highlight that we haven't actually solved for anything um, where the, uh, the strategy has landed us in is we have a system of equations in terms of these quantities, which may be known, may not be known. So in a situation like this, it would be very typical for something like acceleration and normal force to be unknowns, and for the question to ask us, what is the acceleration? What is the normal force? And you can see how quickly we can give that answer if someone were to ask us for acceleration. We can look at this first equation. We see that masses cancel out, and we can give this answer. Acceleration is equal to g sine theta. Or maybe the question asks us for normal force instead. Then we can see here that we can take the second equation, solve it for normal force, and quickly get normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. And because the steps for those last mile will depend on what the question actually asks for, standard strategy lands us in this stage where we are ready to answer any question that someone might ask, but we haven't quite answered it yet. Now, with this example one, you might think um, for a hypothetical question that asked for acceleration, you might say, hey, I could have given this A equals G sine theta in five seconds. You just look at this, G goes in this direction, you take a projection of it along the direction of acceleration, bada bing, you get A equals G sine theta. And yeah, I'm not denying that, that there may be questions where going through standard strategy might seem like uh, nailing something with a power tool. For a simple, easy task, <laughs> you don't need this whole framework. Let me devote examples two and three to situations where if you are trying to approach it intuitively, as in you can stare at the question for a bit and then guess the answer, if that has been the only thing in your toolbox, you would have gotten stuck. The goal of the standard strategy is to give you the steps that you can follow, even for a complicated question where no amount of staring at the question will give you easy, quick, one-step answer. So let me get my example two from the portable TA. 
So I was looking through the portability to see what might give a good illustration of the standard strategy, and I liked this question 9-5. So let me copy this over to my OneNote, and we will demonstrate the standard strategy with this. And by the way, one of the reasons we like to use the portable TA is because it's a book of problem solving. Here's the answer, and the author gives a very detailed solution steps. So I encourage you to look through the answer on your own. Let me copy this over. Oh, look at the time. Let me do examples two and three as a separate video. Bye.